Hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the IQ Journal on Future in Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. ITU allocates frequencies to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum. It develops standards and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU journal, which provides coverage of communication and networking paradigms free of charge for both readers and authors. Our journal welcomes submissions at any time on any topics within its scope. And we believe that this new webinar series will, be, uh, will inspire uh, more contributors from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open our webinar today on Age AI Networks, Challenges and Opportunities with Professor Merouane Deba from Central Superleg France and Technology Innovation Institute, UAE. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. So please submit your questions on the video wall of the neural network. We will address them uh, during the Q&A session. And uh, after the talk and the Q&A, please stay online. We have something very special for you. The Wisdom Corner, live, live lessons. Professor Deba agreed to a very special chat. He will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. I'm now very pleased to introduce the moderator of this webinar, Professor Iana Kildiz, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal and President and Founder of Truva from the United States. We invited Professor Kildiz in August 2020 to launch with us and to lead this new academic journal. And uh, after a year and a half, uh, we are already proudly moving towards impact factor. Professor Akildiz is Ken Bias Chair Professor in Telecommunications Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technology. In the last two decades, he established many research centers in uh, different countries of the world, including South Africa, Spain, Finland, and Saudi Arabia. He's Editor-in-Chief Emeritus of Impact Factor Journals, and he's highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings, visiting distinguished professor in several universities. According to Google Scholar, his age index is 131, and the total number of citations to his paper is over 133,000. His current research interests uh, include the 6G and 7G uh, wireless networks, uh, terahertz communications, internet of bio nano things, molecular communication, intelligent surfaces, and many more topics. So Professor Akildiz, the floor is yours for your opening remarks and to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Alessia. Uh, I had the feeling I'm the speaker, but I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all around the world. I again welcome you to all to our uh, ITU Journal for Future and Emerging Technologies webinar series. I have the immense pleasure to introduce you one of the greatest researchers of his generation, Dr. Merwan, as our distinguished speaker today. Don't be blushed, Merwan. <laughs> Before I present you his career, I want to share my personal experience with him. I knew about him uh, through his papers in the early 2000s. And finally, I met him in person for the first time during the communication theory workshop in Sitges, Spain, where I was the keynote speaker in 2011. I hope you remember it, but I we do. had lunch together and I yeah. really enjoyed his personality, yes. very talkative, jovial and full of energy. Since then, we kept in touch. We met at many conferences. Meruan is the right role model for many people, as I call it, work hard, play hard type guy. Let me talk about his career briefly. Meruan Deba has a very interesting, diverse and vivid career in the last 20 years. He did his entire university education at the very prestigious Ecole Normale Superieure uh, Paris-Saclay and obtained his PhD degree in 2002. 
and his PhD thesis introduced a mathematical framework called free probability theory for the design of wireless networks. After his PhD, Merwan joined the Telecommunication Research Center in Vienna, Austria in 2002. And then uh, uh, to, from 2003 to 2007, he was an assistant professor at Eurocom in Sophie Antipoli in Southern France. As you see, he's uh, finding the best places in Europe. <laughs> then in 2007, at a relatively young age of 31, Merwan joined Central Supelec in Paris as a full professor. It is important to mention that during the time he received the prestigious European Community ERC grant on wireless edge caching. In 2004, actually he was invited to join Huawei Paris, I can say that, and founded the Huawei Mathematical and Algorithmic Sciences Lab with a special focus on mathematical sciences applied to wireless, optical, and networking communications. He grew the lab to 200 researchers by 2020. In 2021, Merwan joined the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi as a chief researcher. The Institute aims to bring together top tier talent from across the globe to research and develop disruptive technological innovations. In parallel, Meron is still a full professor with Central Supelec in France and adjunct professor with Mohammed bin Zayed University of Artificial Intelligence in Abu Dhabi. Again, uh, this is my personal opinion. Meron is an excellent speaker. Thus, he is well sought and invited keynote speaker for many leading conferences, including the conferences I organized. So I always invited him and he always came thanks to that. He received many awards. Uh, they are really good awards, by the way. And not easy to list all of them, but some of them are. Like uh, he received the IEEE Radio Communications Committee Technical Recognition Award uh, in 2019, IEEE Fellow, uh, Eurasip Fellow, and AAIA Fellow, and many other awards. His papers uh, have received several awards, like uh, 18 and 21 IEEE Marconi Prize Paper Award. 16 uh, Communication Society Best Tutorial Paper Award, as well as 15 uh, Leonard Abram Prize and Fred Ellerson Prizes. So these are really very prestigious awards, by the way. And Google Scholar is age index is 98. At this age, is fantastic. When he's in my age, I'm sure he will be like 250. Total number of citations is 46,632. And his research is on the crossroads of fundamental mathematics. I can also say physics, algorithms, statistics, information and communication sciences. Merwan developed many outstanding solutions. I really mean it on small cells uh, for 4G, massive MIMO, 5G and large intelligent surfaces. We shared those uh, directions together also. 6G technologies and of course, AI based solutions for wireless communication systems. So again, uh, we thank you, Merwan, for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks again. Okay, thank you, Jan. I think uh, uh, I I did not miss basically, but you have an excellent memory. It's true that uh, last time we met was uh, I mean the first time we went was in C just in C to the W, and I, I didn't know you by that time, and I was quite impressed by the way. Uh, when I heard your talk, and also I think we had the same sense of humor, and I think this is why uh, we kept being closed. And as you know, we, I invited you after a couple of years in uh, in the south of France, where we spent a good a good evening in Provence, uh, having a good dinner. And I, I think from that all, also kickstarted all the whole kind of interaction. I have to admit that also for all the people around here, um, uh, I mean, I'm giving Jan a lot of credit for also a lot of visionary work he's been doing, especially on the, on the last thing he's been citing on basically large intelligent surfaces and other things like that. So thanks again, Jan, for, for being, in your case, a role model for our basically uh, community. So my talk is gonna be about AI networks and challenges and opportunities. And so um, it's quite interesting uh, that I was invited at, at the ITU here to give a talk on that. I think AI is some kind of, of bridging the gap between many disciplines. And for that point of view, I think uh, 
uh, it's quite good that I'm giving the talk because you can come uh, in that melting pot either from a computer science and mathematics, signal processing, uh, a hardware perspective. And I think this is why it makes uh, such sense uh, uh, to work in that field because you can share at least many point of views. But of course, there's also limitations in that and I'll talk about it. And I think uh, we're doing science here and we need to depart from, I would say, the more marketing uh, aspects of AI to, I would say, more the technological aspects. And my talk is going to try to give you a bit of sense of where things fit in. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm chief researcher at the Technology Innovation Institute, which is a kind of new initiative, which has been built up uh, since more than a year in Abu Dhabi to create uh, a very strong ecosystem in the scientific realm, and especially, I would say, in everything which is related to technology. As Jan said, I've been involved with the community in many aspects, and especially this last year, working mostly on, on 6G and AI. So my talk is going to be divided in three directions. One is going to be a more, more general introduction, which uh, basically explains the setting. And then two things which I think are very important is the space that we're considering around what we call AI for networks, and then what we call networks for AI. And the last part is going to be more tailored about the edge AI realm, which is happening today, and its impact uh, related to the benefit of, of, of how communication systems can improve how AI is being built at the moment. So let me go an introduction and explain with one slide why it has become so important uh, for the communication industry, this whole aspect. I think you're all familiar with what we call the G waves and, uh, and uh, I would say the shift from the different generations that we knew. So yeah, I think you should make a difference between what we call a generation and basically KPIs. So I think you're all familiar with 2G, for which basically the KPI was mostly called round mobile for voice. On the kind of technology that are related to that, you have of course GSM, but you have also IS95 and other types of technology which fulfill those KPIs. Around 2000, we came with a KPI related to mobile for data, and for which we have also several technologies which are related to that, and uh, CDMA 2000 is one of them. 2010 was very interesting because we brought what we call mobile for internet, and that's at the heart of what we call 4G. You need to distinguish, of course, uh, in 4G, the same thing, the KPI, which is mobile for internet, from the technology. For example, there are several technologies which fulfill the KPI of mobile for internet. LTE, of course, is the most famous one, but I think you're also familiar with what we call WiMAX, which is also one technology which fulfills the KPI of mobile for internet. Something also striking, I think, for 4G is that we were so, and I was also one of them in building uh, 4G, we were so focused in bringing what we call mobile for internet that we, that we forgot voice, basically, in 4G. What we mean by that is uh, in 4G systems, uh, voice is not a technology, but an application. So we have a system called voice over IP. It turned out that, which is called voice over LT, by the way. And you have to know that we the voice over IP quality is worse than what you have in a 2G system. And we were so focused in bringing internet and an IP-based kind of scenario that when we sold the first phones, many people came to complain. And at the moment, the majority of networks are built on what we call a CS fallback system. Meaning, whenever you want to make a call, you go on a 2G, 3G network. And whenever you want to browse on the internet, you go on a 4G network. I'm insisting on that point because this is also one of the key aspects that brought me to AI. And I'll explain why, basically, solving the problem of voice over IP for 4G turned out to be a very good exercise for me to understand the benefits of AI, and especially if there was something called AI-based over AI-based voice over LT that I'll talk about after. 5G, I think you're all familiar with that. It's being deployed around the world with a big focus around mobile for things. Although the majority of networks that we're building right now are more or less around broadband communications. But again, it's targeted around this massive connectivity. And now what we're seeing is, of course, the convergence of communication and computing. And where the target of 2030 is to build this supercomputer in which we'll be connecting intelligence and mobile for intelligence. And my talk is going to be about this, this aspect about how we can build basically this uh, mobile for internet intelligence with basically the connectivity that we can bring around that. But before we start that, uh, let me go a bit of, on the historical aspect, because I think history teaches also many things about the future. 
And whenever you need to deal about something in the future, you need to look at the past and especially uh, the fathers of our discipline. And one of the fathers of our discipline is, is Shannon, as I think you, you're all aware of. And beside the two landmark papers that Shannon wrote, uh, which were basically landing the, the field of uh, secrecy and the field of what you called information theory, there was a nice paper called Programming Computer for Playing Chess. Shannon, as you all know, was a, a big chess player and also a game player, by the way. And if you read that paper, there's also all the things that we're doing today. And uh, one of the things that he was explaining is that in the future, we'll see machines, machines which will design filters and equalizers. And this is the whole thing that is happening in AI since a couple of years around AI for physical layer with basically autoencoders to improve the end-to-end -end performance. Machines for designing relay and secret circuits. I think you're seeing it also in many cases in terms of routing protocols, machines which will handle routing thing of telephone calls based on circumstances rather than fixed patterns, machines for performing symbolic mathematical operation, and you can go around that. So you can ask me why Shannon had put forward the fact that AI would play such an important role in communication and not go forward. Well, if you read the paper, he explains exactly that the computing power that we had at that time was not sufficient to build those things. And as you know, we saw the transition these last 20 years on how basically computing power enables all these different points were mentioned. There was another also important point in the work of Shannon, instead of looking at how AI could improve basically the whole systems, is how of course we could also basically use communication to connect basically intelligence. And this is also another uh, problem that he had set up, which is called the semantic problem in communication. In the sense that whenever you start having computing power, whenever you start having memory, then you start building a context when you start communicating, like humans, in the sense that you never communicate for a time to communicate while there's a legacy of the past towards your intended receiver. And by doing that, of course, you start encoding and communicating in a different way, in the sense that the more you talk, the less you need to talk after because the, people, the person behind you understands that. That's called semantic communication. It's at the moment being a big hype, you have to know, and in which also AI is playing an important role in how to solve that. Although I think we're just scratching the surface in the sense that we still haven't had a mathematical definition of what is a semantic information theory and what is semantic information. But uh, we can talk about it afterwards if you want to have more information on what are my thoughts about that. And the last part also, when you look at our fathers, is basically Wiener. Now, without talking machine learning, but just learning, learning is not new. I think uh, if you've been looking at courses of single processing, this is at the heart of control. And the idea is that whenever you have a black box, uh, because basically you can't model and you don't have a model of your environment, then you're going to learn that environment. And by learning what you're going to do, you're going to have a feedback loop on which you're going to shape your input to target that output. So Wiener put that in a very nice way in terms of looking at the optimality in terms of control and defining some kind of quality of service, which was called MMSC at that time, the minimum mean square error, and for which basically you can find what's the optimal input that you need to shape to target that output. And of course, you do that because in general, it's very hard to model basically the black box. And therefore, you're going to go into the learning process. By the way, in wireless, uh, in many mechanisms, we use that. Typically in Wi-Fi, that's exactly what you would do with what we call an ARQ or hybrid ARQ system, and on which you're going to be able to tune your power of transmission, but of course, also your coding rate based on the different, I would say, ACNACs that you receive so that you target that. So the question, of course, is uh, the learning systems are not new. And especially if you were around 2008, 2009, 2010, we've been using a series of algorithms, which goes from best response dynamics, fixtures display, reinforcement learning, joint utility strategy learning, Q learning, multi arm bandits, and imitation learning. And in which basically we've been building algorithms to start to find how you can basically learn in a distributed way the different parameters of your system. Of course, one of the main reasons is that around 2008, due to the massive number of base stations that we're deploying, especially within a scenario called small cells, we had to come up with distributed algorithms in a realm called self-organized networks. And so we started analyzing all those algorithms to make them happen. And of course, you can 
understand them in a very clear manner through what we call a game theoretic setting and which I've been working many years on. And you can build all these algorithms that I'm mentioning on the right here on the screen by basically uh, finding what kind of uh, feedback you had. Is it the action that you see? Is it the utility? And you can also devise the kind of uh, basically uh, inputs that you want to have. Is it what we call pure strategies or mixed strategies? The end of story end up, ended with two things, which made these algorithms not so fancy at all. The first one is that the kind of utility functions that you need to optimize in wireless do not have the right properties for the convergence of the algorithms that we built. What I mean by that in general, you need to have what we call utilities which are convex. And by usually having utility which are convex in general, well, if I tell you that uh, one of the metrics is the outage, it's not convex and then it doesn't converge as you want. So that was already some kind of, of back off in terms of using those algorithms. Second is, of course, we found ways to convexify the system. And this is something, by the way, you usually use in uh, wireless, is whenever you have a problem, you want to convexify your system, you will basically take some kind of expected utility because expectations convexify your system. But whenever you take expected utility, you don't play what we call pure strategies, but you, you play what we call uh, mixed strategies. You will find what is the best probability you will use an action for. For, for example, uh, accessing an access point, it will be what is the property that you'll access access point one, and what is the property you will access access two, and then what you will define is how you will play randomly with these probabilities so that you can ensure a, an expected rate. But expected rate, as you all know, is not something people are satisfied with, because if I tell you that I have an average of 10 megabit per second, then it's quite obvious that it would mean that in terms of quality of service, you would not have nothing. And then what moment you would have a peak in terms of rate. So at the end, basically, that was also second caveat of these techniques is that uh, the kind of utility that you can work out does not is not compatible with the, with the things you have. And of course, this relates also to the convergence. Once you have it, the convergence rate is not new, is not going well. So it, it turned out a lot of learning algorithms to go down. And of course, now we're seeing a, a new trend of reusing all those algorithms with the notion of deep. And the question of deep is, of course, is that you can store all the past data that you've been playing so that you can speed up the convergence. Because basically by acquiring all the information that you had before, then whenever you restart a learning process, you're not lear restarting learning it from scratch. You also use all the models that you've been created based on the data to move forward. And that's typically something that happens in your life. I mean, depending on the country where you live, uh, some, for example, kids have, do not have school some days. For example, in France, in general, it's Wednesday. And so the kind of route that you'll choose to reduce the traffic on Monday and Tuesday will be totally different from what you will be using on Wednesday. And that's because you learn progressively that on Wednesday, kids do not have school, so you can use that kind of route. And so you can speed up your convergence in terms of how you make your some choices based on the fact that you have a huge amount of data that has been stored and experienced. And this is the big game changer that we're seeing right now in terms of what I call here deep, and the deep no, deepness will appear many times. The second thing also that is a game changer today is the fact that the cost of memory has been going very down and the cost of computing has been going very down. And which makes it that also we can have more and more computing basically units at the TX and computing units at the, at the RX so that whatever we start you know, learning in terms of data, we can create some kind of models to be able to construct and connect the intelligence. And I think this is also a big shift that we're seeing from the classical 1948 model where basically data storage and computing was not at the TX and RX and in which we're seeing now a transition and how we can exploit it. I'll talk about it also on the second type of transition. And of course, the third one is basically the three kind of, of things which is happening today, which also uh, pushes us to relook at how we did the whole thing before. And those three things are basically the massive amount of data that we've been able to gather since all these years and asking ourselves what we can do with that. Second, of course, is the kind of GPUs that we're using and the computing capacity for which the prices has been going low down for quite fast. And the third one is the sophistication in terms of learning algorithms that we've been using these recent years and basically the improvement that we've been seeing in terms of how uh, faster we can implement stuff. Of course, AI is not new. I think you all know about it. It started already in 1956 with a very famous conference where there were a big couple of uh, 
of our, I would say, learning fathers related to Turing and others, and went through a couple of winters. And I think you're all so familiar with these winters. And now we're seeing, of course, a big kind of hype at the moment. And that's because of the three things I mentioned. On my personal view, I think we're also going to be going towards the next winter of AI. And I think we'll talk about it at the conclusion. I think one of the big winters is going to be the energy winter in the sense, and this is typically of, of all the recent advances that we've been seeing, the technology that we've been using, call it blockchain, call it Bitcoins, call it AI. There is a big question mark around basically their impact uh, on the what you could say the good. And this is why it's a good session where I'm here at the ITU in terms of the energy consumption that we're pouring in. The amount of energy that is required to train our models is so huge that of course questions are being asked on the sustainability of the kind of work we're doing. But this is another question that uh, we can talk about at the end in terms of uh, basically the impact that we're seeing today of the AI the next winter that can happen because of the amount of of things that we're using. And of course, uh, the main uh, driver that has impacted our discipline uh, is in terms of algorithmic aspect, when I was saying about this big shift, is of course related to uh, the use of what we call deep neural networks. And of course, with this uh, three top uh, uh, shot guys that give, whenever they give conferences today, you have like 20,000 people gathering, uh, listening to them. But of course, the kind of work that they've been doing and implementation that they did is has had a huge impact on our discipline. And we'll talk also about it quite rapidly. So let me go forward in a nutshell in explaining AI for those who are not familiar with that and explaining why it's so important, but also the caveats in my introduction. And then I'll go into the networking aspect in explaining the 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 kind of 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 of, uh, of use that we could use for communication. Uh, here you have two examples. You have one basically picture of a guy called Newton, and I think you're all familiar with that guy. And the other uh, picture that you have on the left is what we call here ballistic kick. Ballistic kick means you, you need to kick a ball. And so when you want to kick a ball, you have two options. Is either you went to school, you learned about a guy called Newton, and then you solved the Newton equations, and then you can find what is basically the angle which you can kick a ball for a given distance d, call it 100 meter. Second option is that you never had access to Newton. So you never have access to this model, or for some reason, you, you can't discover it because it takes time in science to make discoveries. Then you can still solve the problem. And to solve it, it's a big data-driven approach. What you do is you kick the ball like hell. So you kick the ball many times and you put in two columns. One is called distance, the other is called angle. And by compiling all these distances and angle, next time your uh, uh, chief tells you to kick the ball 100 meter, you look at the table if 100 meter is there and find the angle. So this is classical. It's called data mining. It has nothing new, by the way. However, you still need to find, I would say, some kind of sophisticated algorithm to go forward in finding the distance and the angle, meaning that uh, you're not going to do a search one, two, three, but you're going to clusterize your data by saying 100 is in the class 90, 110, and then by having a sophisticated algorithm, you can converge. Where you would talk about intelligence, but again, has nothing to do about intelligence. It has mostly uh, a notion of what we call function approximation. And that's what the whole story boils down at this stage at the moment, or regression is if the distance of 100 meters is not there. So if the, if the distance of 100 meters is not there, then basically what you would say is, if I have the distance of 90 meters and I have the distance of 110, then 100 is some kind of mean distance between the two. And so what you're going to do, you're going to go in the angle domain and find the kind of combination that you would do within the angles to find the angle. And so what you were able to do is find a way to kick the ball, basically without knowing Newton, and get an accurate result. So what you've been doing is some kind of approximation where you would say that x here, where x is what you have in the abscess, is a function of theta. And what you've been doing is find what is the approximation of that function. And so what's fantastic, which has happened recently, is that we're able to find a way to find a rapid way to do this function approximation through some, uh, I would say, kind of uh, projection on the basis, which is a neural basis. And basically, by doing this function approximation, we're able to find quite rapidly what is the relation between the x and the theta by approximating this function. In fact, what you do, you have a black box. And that box, box you train it with all the data, where you do this function approximation, and you will learn that function. And you have a way to project that function 
with what we call neural networks, where you have weights that you will define and you will optimize. And next time you're asked to give at a given distance where you put the X, you get the theta. So it's quite magic because with this very simple example, I was able to, to show you that you can replace Newton, but you can replace also Maxwell. You can replace many kinds of fundamental equation with this approach. So you would say that the story is ending, but in fact, the story is much more complicated than that. And I went quite fast in explaining you that with this data-driven approach, you could, you could solve all the problems of, uh, of science that you had. The first caveat of the method I was mentioning is, of course, the fact that uh, you don't necessarily know what are the input-output parameters of your problem. In fact, by going quite fast, I told you that there was a one-to-one -one mapping between x and theta. In fact, it's wrong. If you went to high school, you learned that the initial speed, v0, is extremely important here. By initial speed, meaning here the v0, meaning that what you need is two inputs, one output, meaning you need to know x, v0, and I can find you the theta, which is a classical problem that data scientists have today, in the sense that if you go in the medical domain, and you're a smart data scientist who has just graduated from master program, uh, the doctor will give you columns and they will tell you, okay, you have this column, which is temperature and the other column, which is a cancer. And he will tell you now, I give you a new temperature, find me if the, the, if the candidate has a cancer. It seemed quite obvious for you that you cannot have a mapping between temperature and cancer. The question is which column you would need to add to find the relation. Is it blood pressure? Is it some kind of past father, what he had, and things like that? And this is in general where you spend a lot of time trying to find how to tune your system in terms of input-output relation. So it tends to be a tedious job, whereas with Newton, it was quite easy to find the solution. Second caveat with this technique is that the energy that you're consuming is outrageous compared to Newton. Well, you will kick the ball when it's sunny. But then the day you're asked to kick the ball, it may be windy. So you will need to, to kick the ball also when it's windy. But which kind of wind do you need to kick the ball in which condition is another question because you would need to kick the ball when it's a wind of five, five kilometers an hour, 10 kilometers an hour, 15 kilometers an hour, and you go on like that. So the amount of training would require that you test all the configuration. This is not possible. So, of course, smart people have been um, inventing algorithms which are called transfer learning, for example, meaning you learn in a given scenario and you can transfer your learning to speed up. But still, it doesn't solve the problem of the huge amount of energy that is deployed to get one single parameter, one single result. And this is something, by the way, we've been seeing in the network design is that we need to run every time we build a network for every kind of city. Basically, when it's a CCD with skyscrapers, without skyscrapers, when it, for a given frequency F1, F2, F3, to find basically all the tuning that we can do. And the last, I would say, most difficult approach of this problem is that if you have kicked on Earth and did still all the configuration that you can imagine on Earth, you have no clue on how to kick on the moon. And so you never know how to solve new configurations that you've never seen before. So you can not approximate what's happening on the moon from what you have learned on Earth. And so this is a huge problem. It's not a problem related to AI, but it's really a problem on how we're doing machine learning, in the sense that machine learning is mostly classification problem. It's mostly a function approximation problem. We need basically to discover gravity out of the data. And if you want to discover gravity out of the data, you can't use the classical techniques. You need to look more at what we call topological spaces. You need more to look at invariants or techniques that could shape your data, rotate your data, translate your data, so that you can discover what are the invariants and discover what is gravity. Because at the end, gravity is an invariant, by the way. And so at the moment, the techniques that we have are not capable of solving those problems. There's still a lot of research which is being done at the mathematical front, especially inventing new kind of geometrical tools, topological tools to do it. But there's still years to come before we can go to this, I would, kind, I would say that's kind of new AI approaches we're talking about. Now, why are we so happy about using these techniques, even though we know the caveats? Well, the biggest success was done basically in speech recognition. And I think you're all familiar with that. So Jan, I think 
was within the 80s realm. And if you were within the 80s realm, you would know that a lot of people did what we call speech recognition by model, what we call here the larynx, meaning here on your throat and your mouth, by modeling it as a filter and trying to find a way to, um, to find what are the filter parameters to model basically the way you could construct some kind of uh, voice or noise. And all the people who had did did speech recognition in the 80s, it was never successful. We tried, and you have a lot of textbooks doing that. The day we decided to throw speech recognition by looking basically at model, but seeing it as a classification problem, there was a huge success which happened, meaning that we recorded a lot, a lot of voices without really trying to understand how they were captured or created. And next time a person would uh, speak, then we do some kind of what we call here uh, correlation and find what is the closest matching. And once we have that matching, we knew what it was, there was a big breakthrough. And this is what's happening today. These kind of correlation-based approaches have been a big success, and this is what happened. And this is what we saw also, by the way, in the image uh, industry or, or basically a big data industry based on images, and this has been going on. And of course, this has changed totally the mindset of people from changing from model based approaches to data-driven approaches. Of course, I think in science, you need to take, um, I would say, the advantages of both. We can talk about it during the sessions on questions. I think the best approach is still to try to bridge the gap between both. Although everybody's jumping on these data-driven approaches, we have ways now of bridging the gap between model-based and data-driven approaches. And the last point of my introduction is the data. I think, some of you may be familiar with this uh, kind of historical fact. And I think it's quite important for you to understand how the data is quite crucial in influencing basically the kind of data-driven approaches that you're going to be coming up. So this kind of airplane is the kind of airplane that was going from England to Europe bombarding basically the Germans and coming back in the UK bases. And the kind of red dots that you're seeing here on the airplane is exactly basically the shots that the airplane got when going back to the England the, the, to the English uh, uh, bases. And at that time, the commander of the base was asking basically the, 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 the guys who were doing statistics, the statistics uh, which are now called data scientists, by the way. And the question that they had that was asked to those guys was, where should we reinforce the plane based on all the shots that you're seeing? And of course, what the guys were saying is that whenever there was more red dots, you would, you would put more metal to protect the plane. So that, of course, it would reinforce the plane when it goes to Europe and bombard. And of course, the pilot came in. And the pilots, what they were saying is that, on the contrary, you should reinforce where there is no red dots. So this could come as a surprise. In fact, it should not. The main reason is what we call the missing data. What I mean by that is that the airplanes that never came back was exactly the, the airplanes which were shot on the cockpit here. And what I mean here is that, of course, you see no red dots on the cockpits because the planes that never came back were shot. And so what happens is that when you have a set of data, then you'll take some conclusions if you don't know the process, how you gather the data. So of course, for a guy who knows how the data was, was created, then he would take a different decision than from the plain data that you have. So I'm mentioning this example for a simple reason is that whenever you gather data, you need also to know how it was processed and gathered, which also questions basically the fact that academics have very few data from coming from industry. And industry has the data. And one of the reasons, and I was working in a couple of years, for a couple of even for many years, by the way, in industry, that uh, usually industry does not release data, has nothing to do with privacy. There are, of course, questions about you know sensitive data that you really reveal to the public. But the main reasons that industry does not give data is because if we give data, then we need also to reveal the process on how the data was created. Because otherwise, the guys who will be using it would be taking false decisions. So the main reasons why you don't do it is because you need to, do, to, make, uh, to give the process on how you generated the data. But if an industry decides to reveal how the process of generating the data was done, it would reveal also its know-how. And if you reveal the know-how, then you basically lose all the options of your industry because that's exactly your value. So of course, this is some work that needs to be uh, done at the industry level to understand better 
how we can still provide data to academics, for example, so that they can do work and, and move forward in basically the realm of the research. And as you know, if one of the reasons the telecom industry has not been going so fast on AI compared to the uh, speech recognition or basically the image recognition industry is that because the telecommunication industry has not been so open, uh, the industries that have been very open in terms of releasing their data have been making huge progress basically at the scientific realm. So there's some work to be done at the telecom industry to look at how basically we can become open and still basically saving our industry in the sense that not revealing our, the know-how on how things would be generated. So of course, we can still have leaders in the telecom industry. So I think I went quite uh, long this introduction, but I think it was very important to set basically the, the kind of, of setting that is required to understand where we are at the moment on the use of this. My second point here is gonna be about two things. One is gonna be about, of course, the AI and how it's impacting basically the networks. And then I'll talk about something which I think is more, it's more interesting is basically how we are, are able and within the ITU to build in the future the networks, which will enable to connect all these AIs together. So I mentioned at the beginning, one reason I jumped into AI. I'm more of a background related to mathematics, physics, it was mentioned by Jan. Uh, I never believed basically that data-driven approaches would be better than uh, uh, model-based approaches, because I strongly believe in the fact that uh, we have uh, a reason to be here is to capture basically through mathematical models nature. But there was one problem that I was never able to solve, which I was asked to solve around 2014. And that's the problem of voice over LT, meaning how you can improve voice over LT experience on a 4G network. And so I tried modeling voice over LT through equations. I was never able to do it, meaning I had a very good understanding of the physical layer. But then you have all the servers where they are, the IP. So expressing in a mathematical formula what you would call the end-to-end -end metric of voice over LT was not possible. Because once you have that mathematical formula, then of course things are easy. You can jump in in what we call optimization and derive basically the optimal kind of, of parameters that you need to do it. And it took me two years to work it out with all the, my colleagues, finding ways, looking at, at, at SNR improvements and looking at where we should put the servers. But then there was all, all the things related to what we call the IPsec protocol. And when I started talking with the business units, they came up with the fact that they had measured a lot of voice over LTE, basically quality of experience related to different deployments that uh, my former company was deploying around the world. And that triggered a lot of interest for me because for one day I said, well, this is great because we have a lot of different configuration, what we call spatial temporal configuration of base stations and a lot of basically voice over LTE measurements which are made for those configurations. Now, if you give me a new set of voice over LTE requirements, I could find you what is the best basically spatial or spatial temporal configuration related to those KPIs. And it turned out that that's what we did and using this big data approaches. And I was quite astonished to find basically improvements. And these are the kind of deployments that we did with Vodafone Turkey of in the downlink of roughly 81% have been proven. And in the uplink, as you can see, numbers which are of the same uh, kind of, of real 22%. And that changed totally my view on using AI for that. And of course, it changed totally my view at which point that, of course, uh, we were starting to relook at how AI would revolutionize the, uh, the telecommunication industry, in which basically we departed from the classical wireless algorithm where the value is a link to basically an AI algorithm, which is the data, and in which basically we started looking at more end-to-end -end metrics, which is at the heart of what people have been trying for years called cross-layer design, and which never worked. And for which you can see here, by using basically more uh, uh, target metrics, you can do it. And for which instead of doing some kind of uh, tuning parameters manually, you just set the targets. And today you have a bunch of uh, top, key researchers which are implementing a very number of different algorithms going from the pure physical layer to I would say more the service layer with different of course also kind of 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 of, uh, of types of algorithms going from regression clustering classification to reinforcement learning to dynamic optimization GMM HMMs associated rule mining to more deep learning 
reinforcement deep learning, transfer learning, and graphical algorithms. And you can see, you can go to things which are very physical layer, like PAPR, nonlinear compensation, or LT power control, where you could use basically techniques related to AI to improve the performance to things which are more at the higher level, which are related to AI base stations, improvement, things like that. And also the kind of different things that you can implement goes also from the operation and management to also improving network performance, to also looking at new things that you can do like uh, AI-based localization uh, related to the techniques that you can use in improving. So of course, in general, all these techniques uh, improve drastically whenever you don't have already a model which is already good enough to represent uh, the reality. And you're stuck basically in terms of finding. And if you don't have a model, of course, then you get a drastic improvement. And one of the things that we learned is that uh, the kind of end-to-end -end metric that we're dealing today makes it that the kind of models combining, I would say, more upper layers to lower layers makes it quite impossible to bridge the gap. And these techniques become quite um, astonishing of, in doing that. And here you can see more focused examples, uh, which showcases you also the performance that you gain. And this is, goes to what we call AI-based massive MIMO, where basically in terms of base stations, you're able to find the best beams that you can transmit uh, only based on the various beams that you sent related to the localization of the different users and be able to improve rapidly what kind of new beams you can use to things also that people have been reassessing related to fingerprinting. I think you're all familiar with fingerprinting, which is basically trying to be able to localize a user based on his, what we call spatial signature or a spatial Phys, um, frequency signature that you get where based on different points that you have measured in space and different kind of signatures, you're able based on a new signature to find where it's localized. And these kinds of things are also quite nice in the sense that we've been developing algorithms that are robust to changes of your environment. Because usually all these techniques are very linked to the fact that it's done in a given environment. Whenever there are changes, like you put a new chair as changes, we have now more sophisticated related algorithms related to what we call persistent homology, where you find the, what is persistent from one configuration to the other configuration and be still able to localize, stuff like that. And to re-looking at all the different, I would say, kind of algorithms related to schedulers, for example, resource allocations, where you can also build up the whole system based on neural network. And this also targets, as I said, in the same way, whenever you have a hard time defining your kind of, of metric, and with, especially in end-to-end, -end, you're able then to find basically the kind of policy that you can do to be able to improve your system. And, and you've got a bunch of papers published uh, since I would say two or three years showcasing the benefit of relooking at that. Of course, there's the caveats to these techniques. Not everything is magic. The caveats, as I told you, is that uh, you're able in general to configure what are the optimal kind of, of, of policies resource allocation strategies for a given configuration. Whenever the configuration of your setting changes, the number of users, uh, the kind of conditions, the frequency, uh, other things, then you need to retrain. And there at the end, the cost turns out to be quite expensive related to classical model-based approaches. Let me talk more here about what I think has the most impact for the future, which I think is very important for us, is the networks for AI. All the techniques I've been mentioning until now have been very focused on, I would say, a more cloud point of view of how things are done. In the sense that in general, what happens is that whatever data you gather, you're going to centralize all that data in a given point, which is what we call a cloud. And then in the cloud, you'll be running what we call the training, which is, you remember, this black box I was mentioning, where basically you will train your neural network. And then once you have that, you will put an input and get an output, which is the inference phase. Now we realize whenever we start building a network, there's many constraints in centralizing all the data in a very central point. And I can give you a couple which are quite reasonable. The first one is of course, the huge overhead in terms of backholing that is required to bring the data. And that has a huge cost for us, bringing bit back the data always back to a central uh, uh, kind of, of, of unit. The second is, of course, the kind of latency requirements that you have. And basically, sometimes you don't have time to get back the data, to get a decision and go back. The autonomous car is a very good example for that. 
The third one is basically privacy, for which also many people complain due to the fact that they don't want to have their data going out from their premises. Hospitals, for example, are one. The fourth one is coverage, meaning you start playing with your device. You want to have some kind of inference of a give, on a given task. And basically, you're not covered because there's no coverage, and you still have to have an intelligent phone. And so the question is basically how you start building an architecture for which you can solve all the problems I was mentioning without having a very centralized system and being able to do the training and update in a very distributed manner. How you can build up what we call here unified training and inference network on which basically AI is positioned either as a device at the edge of the cloud, and you can still play with that. And so this is a trend that we're seeing in communication, but by the way, this is also a trend we're seeing in computing. And the thing is, of course, the idea in general, even in computing, is that you don't want to move any more the data to where the computing unit, where the computing unit is, but you want to move basically the computing where the data is. In the case of the people who work in computer science, this is called post Neumann architecture. It's called in-memory processing. But here we have the same kind of trend where we want to move in the network, not anymore the data, but we want to move just the computing information that we have. And we want to bring computing closer and closer to where the data is. And we only want to get out from the device, basically the model that we train with that. The caveat, of course, when you do that is that at a given device in general, you don't have that huge data that we talked about in the cloud. And the question is how you can leverage from all these things. And of course, the big trend is to look at distributed AI techniques that could leverage from that massive amount of small data that you have and how you can create collective intelligence from a massive amount of individual intelligence, something we humans know. The way by the way, our brain works or how nature has been made is not basically getting all of the data that we learn across our life and getting it back in the central unit and then doing something. But the way we interact, basically, we exchange models, in fact, when we interact. And what we do, basically, we try to bring some kind of collective intelligence based on individual intelligence. Of course, this gives a lot of oppor great opportunities for standardization. I think ITU has a big role here to play. So we're not going to standardize here AI because your AI is not going to be standardized. What you're going to standardize here is the interfaces, how you talk, how often you talk, what kind of signaling you're going to be talking so that people can plug in their super sophisticated algorithms to leverage basically the benefit. The second thing also, which is important for us here, is also to be able to compute on the edge. And this is not easy to do. Many stakeholders coming from Qualcomm, Huawei, NVIDIA, and others, already working on what we call edge AI uh, computing. And for which basically the realm of how you do computing with the classical DNN, where you have basically stochastic gradient descent cannot work anymore. And for which you need to relook at how you do low precision AI, for example, on a device, where you have, for example, low precisions up to basically weights, which can only take zero and ones. And how you can do, for example, a gradient descent with a zero and one. As you all know, you cannot do a derivative when you're constrained by a zero and one. And so you need to rethink of all the optimization techniques that used to be done and how you implement this stuff to be able to make it work. Binary neural networks, for example, are one trend today to make it happen, but we have a bunch of other ways to do it. And of course, the kind of algorithms I was mentioning before is also important. I was talking before about distributed AI, but in the way you do distributed AI, things do not scale. One of the most, I would say, known algorithm today in this distributed AI setting is called federated learning. But federated learning, for example, does not scale. And then you need to clusterize your system or find a way on how to map things so that you depart from the current cloud and AI perspective we we're talking before to something where you have an integrated cloud network and AI. And when you have clusters with a master, stuff like that, and I think all this is open depending on the kind of constraints that you have in your cell networks corresponding to energy efficiency constraints, uh, latency constraints, and others you can have in your mind. Now, of course, um, I talked about at the beginning about the classical aspects, which was very centralized. The thing that we're seeing today, which is mostly about how you distribute and exchange models between them, but of course the future is gonna be about more collaborative AI, which is more about 
looking at these connections of control and distributed AI, on which this all aspects of multi-agent, uh, deep reinforcement learning and other techniques works, just the way we work today, in the sense that uh, instead of just exchanging basically the models we talk about, we have also some mechanism of basically collaborating between us to infer on a given system. This is, I think, still open and at the start starting stage, uh, and there's many reasons we can talk about it. I've been working with a lot of colleagues on, on approaches related to that and understanding how these algorithms scale in the mean field setting. Uh, and But it's still like a long route because we don't have any ID on how a system would behave in terms of, of being stable and you go on forward around that. I want to also mention that within also that setting that we're talking about, there's also the whole notion of of also what you want to communicate. Because there's a notion, of course, of exchanging to infer something, but you need also devices who start also to behave in a different way in terms of communication that you used to have now. And there's also this big trend I was mentioning to before about going from deep learning systems to deep reasoning systems. This is, I think, we're just scratching the surface. I've been working with some colleagues on trying to understand that, but the deep reasoning aspect, I think, is going to be the next big thing on uh, departing from the deep learning to deep reasoning, and for which the tools that we have today, at least at the mathematical front or fundamental front, are not, from my point of view, still mature enough to make it happen, especially if you're targeting 6G. So it will be like mostly a post-6G or 7G aspect that uh, that Jan was mentioning, or it was mentioned on what the kind of, of, of approaches that that uh, Jan is working on on 7G, uh, but uh, but I think this is very important for us also to mention at at this stage. I think I finished my talk, giving you a big overview of 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 what I think uh, AI is doing today to our industry. Uh, of course, I'm quite open for the questions at the moment to answer all the different points, and I hope it was really interesting for you to have uh, this. I would say short, uh, uh, intense, basically talk and giving you my point of view. Thanks a lot, Miran. Excellent talk, really. Uh, I Thank you. learned also a lot your views, and uh, it opened up, uh, in my opinion, uh, horizons for many young people. And uh, thanks for the uh, kind of like uh, roadmap for the AI area. And I'm waiting for some uh, questions from the audience while they, I'm hoping that they will show up. Uh, let me ask you uh, my opinion. Uh, you mentioned the, I love that terminology about AI winter one and AI winter two. And, you know, I personally went through those phases. That was in 1980s. There was a huge hype here in the US, even also in Europe, of course, uh, in Asia also. But uh, there were, there was a lot of money invested. Uh, like cognitive science, AI, and AI. And uh, when you try to find the faculty job, they always said, uh, are you in AI? So really, you, you start to get a complex saying, you know, what am I missing? You know, I was in telecom, right? So, and then uh, it died down, you know, at the end of the 80s, early 90s. And then uh, uh, again, about your winter two, I'm not sure exactly what time frame, frame you're talking about. Maybe your winter too is that my, you know, the 80s. But anyhow, so my personal opinion is, as we uh, see in our uh, research uh, community, uh, when the wind starts to blow and then people say, okay, this is great now. Let's get into AI because it's our topic. And blindly, many, many people are keep writing papers, right? I mean, they don't care about uh, impact and progress and all that stuff. So, uh, and of course, there are very valuable contributions too. So I have to admit that. But, you know, my personal opinion is I hope it will not die down. As you said, winter three, you mentioned that you expect that. Well, you didn't elaborate that. Maybe you will explain that. But my opinion is I hope this winter three will not show up because when you uh, work with AI techniques or machine learning algorithms, like, for example, neural networks or deep learning algorithms, that's all based on probabilities, you know. And I also call this, like, uh, in, in Europe, uh, in Central Europe, they make these sausages, right? You put something in, it comes out as a sausage. Don't ask what's internal inside is, right? 
So, uh, you know, a lot of things happening in these hidden layers and you hope that the outputs will be reliable. So, you know, uh, the, the, the end of this discussions, you know, uh, how reliable will these outputs be? Because we are really dealing with a lot of probabilities and how much can we rely on those outcomes? So first question is about your winter three. <laughs> and the other question is about uh, this reliability of the results coming out from these machine learning algorithms. And my personal opinion is, again, since at least 10 years, I'm hoping to understand the brain. There is a brain initiative in Europe and also yeah. in the US and in Asia, and try to understand more about the brain functionalities and really mimic those. You know, uh, it's yeah. very complex, as you know, but many of us are like from these fields like telecom, they're only interested, you know, how can we use these, you know, train these machine models and come up with these uh, accurate results. So what is your opinion? So I have three different questions, as you realize. And in the meantime, we are getting questions now. Yeah, so many questions. Uh, 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 yeah, so of course, uh, let's say the following. Uh, there is a tendency, so I mean, there's a tendency today in in the AI to to you I mean to to go on the low hanging fruits, but I think this is all, the way research is done. <laughs> you know, uh, everybody jumps, takes the low hanging fruits, and that's how you go fast. You publish your papers, and and I think we haven't touched upon the hard problems that you were mentioning, and I think this is very important. And what I mean by hard problems is, of course, what you're saying, trying to understand how the brain works, uh, going beyond. The class opening the black box, looking at basically the the kind of, of 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 explainable AI that you can go through, and I think that's hard problems because we haven't invested enough, from my point of view, on the fundamentals and the tools that would be required to understand that. I have still no clue if that those tools would come from biology, uh, from physics, from mathematics, but for sure I'm quite sure they'll come from the fundamentals the sense that people need to come up with new tools to be able to understand how basically you can uh, understand gravity from the data. That's it, well, that's what you want. You, if you want to discover Newton, if you want to have something that from a huge massive numbers of, 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 of apples which are falling, uh, then basically you, you crash those data and you can discover gravity, that's what you would like. And I think we're not able to do that today because we don't have the tools. We're just at the at scratching the surface, which is a bit on, on uh, I mean, not easy to do. Second is the winter you were talking. So I think you lived through the, those winters that uh, uh, we were mentioning, winter one and winter two. Um, the the thing which which is striking today is of course that uh, people have been taking computing power for granted. And all the people are more computing oriented, meaning that uh, uh, there's no person who's spending time on trying to understand stuff. Because computing is there, and, and you see it with the announcement, NVIDIA, and the more you, you have GPUs, the more, the happier you are. And we're seeing it this every day. And I think uh, today, I would never put one against the other in the sense that I think there's some work to do. So let me just give you an example. When you look at these people who are rediscovering physical layer through basically uh, 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 AI, saying, okay, I want to transmit and, uh, and I'm going to solve the problem. They say, okay. Well, one of the reasons we want to do that is because we have good models of basically the, the wireless channel, but in terms of the TX with the impairments and RX with the impairments, we're not able to represent the black box. So we'll do training. There, this is where I put a red flag is, we well, do have some prior information. I mean, there are some legacy that we've been building. How do you bridge the gap? How do you put a prior on your neural network that you know things about the channel? Because we've been working and there's a lot of legacy in terms of science that we've been making. And I think this is something that is missing drastically the way we are. The winter then I was talking about, which I think will come, is when you think about all the technologies that we're inventing today, they're mostly computing power oriented. Bitcoins, things like that. We haven't solved the problem of finding. So if you think about Newton and how much energy would cost you to know the number of how you kick a ball compared to the huge amount of crashing data that you need to do that, there's a problem. There is a problem. We need to find a way to solve that. And, and this is where I think if we cannot, the winter would come because the cost of energy is increasing. <laughs> uh, we have, you know, you're seeing it now. I mean, you're in the U.S., so you know the price of, uh, of gas <laughs> and how it is, it's going on now. It's not going to go slowing down. 
And the number of configuration is not possible to capture everything. So we need to come back to more people who are doing models, which is, by the way, also the big shift of science that we saw. When you think of the way science was done, you take Newton. Newton, what he did is first discover with a couple of experiments the fact that gravity would happen and use the data to validate his model. Today, what we do is use data to create the model, which is a different shift. You know, science is not anymore about, I look at a couple of things, experiments, and then I learn from it, and I use the huge number of data to validate, is about find me basically the, the model after this. And I think the shift of science is something we need to rethink about. Thank you, uh, uh, Merwan. Uh, there is a question uh, from our office at ITU, Reinhard Schroer. He's asking, will you have some data uh, or some numbers regarding the energy consumption you just mentioned, by the way? That's why I'm asking this question of training AI models. Yeah, so we do. Numbers. Yeah. yeah, we do. I don't have them here in front of me, but uh, we've been in, 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 uh, in, uh, in TII. Uh, so this is also an announcement. We're, we're running basically today the biggest language model in Arabic. So you have to know that in Arabic, it doesn't exist, a GPT-3 model. And 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 uh, which which is great because it will be uh, uh, something a, a model of roughly 10, 10 to thirteen billion parameters, which is the, the approach of what is being used today called exascale types of models, and the kind of power energy that was run, that we're running is quite outrageous, in the sense that we need to crash a lot of data to get those GPUs. So we're releasing a paper exactly on the total energy that is required to do that. And I can send it to all the people who are interested uh, around basic things. And there's many, many papers who have been already uh, mentioning that. So uh, if you have time, there's a nice paper of MIT uh, in uh, 2018 or 2018, which was mentioning exactly the question about the carbon footprint of, of AI. And, you, and the whole numbers are there and giving that, those numbers to you on, okay. on, on uh, the sustainability of those approaches. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And there is another question from Elma Zanai from uh, Polytechnic University of Tehran in Albania. Do you think that we can use AI also in underwater wireless sensor networks when the energy is a concern? I yeah. Think, simple question. So that's why. I'm... Yeah, the question is simple. The answer is yes, definitely. The, you will gain, it's, question, it's more a question how much you will gain. It's not a, if you can use, you can always use. Uh, uh, let's say, black box approaches, machine learning approaches. The question is, how much do you gain? And there, you have to go up in, in asking yourself, are the models that we have in that disciplines, which I'm not familiar with, good enough to represent those links with this energy? If they're not good enough, then basically you can go for that. If, they're, if, the, if the standard is of that discipline or that context is already good, then the gains you would see is minor. There is another question by uh, John Den Robert. Uh, he says he's a student at RIT. I don't know, is it Rochester Institute of Technology or something else? Speaking of voice over IP, do you think it's possible to apply a machine learning model? I'm laughing because yes, you can apply, of course, right? Anywhere, it's like a hammer you can put everywhere. But anyhow, let me continue. To perform an adaptive QS policing yes. and or, call. or call, call admission control and edge routers or will, uh, will it be too slow or can you think of other challenges? Yeah, so this is typically the example where I think you would gain a lot because for voice over IP, you go through the IP protocol and, and there, this is exactly what we did for the voice over LT I was talking about. We adapted not only basically the, the kind of, of, of layout, find the optimal layout in terms of base station, but find also the tuning of the parameters of your base station in terms of, of coverage and other things that you need to do. So this is exactly typically the example that you, that where you would see striking gain, by the way. Thank you. And uh, there is another question by Mohammed Wasim Akhtar. He is a postdoc researcher in machine learning at Mid Sweden University. The question is what are the directions to standardize the metaverse and joint communication and sensing? So, this is a more difficult question. It's not related to me. So, I don't know if you can standardize the metaverse. Uh, what I can answer to you is just that. Uh, 
AI per se are algorithms. What you would do in terms of standardization activity, which is being taken place right now, is mostly standardizing the interfaces, meaning how, how, how you're going to talk, what is the signaling format, and things like that. So for your question about uh, standardizing the metaverse, I have no clue. And the same thing for drone communication and sensing. Uh, uh, you can only standardize basically the kind of interfaces on talking, which is exactly what's happening already today. Thanks again. Uh, there is also a question from a, uh, I don't know, this is a very interesting name. I, I don't think it's Portuguese, but Daniel Alice de Sange or yes. Saint-Tian Mecca de Guggenheim, <laughs> telecom engineer and CEO at some place, TMG, whatever. I, I don't know. So he didn't mention where he is or she, I don't know. Uh, uh, what are the main challenges telcos are facing in actively implementing AI to improve their network infrastructure? I so, think you mentioned in your talk, but still, please. Yeah, so first of, so first of all, as I was mentioning before, is already uh, gathering the data needs a certain process on which you need to build to make it clean and stuff like that. So telco uh, operators are not always the people who have all the data. It depends on with the stakeholders on whether they're working, especially if you have over the top player, what we call OTT, but also people would be more like vendors of infrastructure and on which you would need to share, which is not always easy to do. Second thing also is basically the process, which is a bit of work of all the cleaning and labeling of your data. Because I didn't mention it is, uh, we're still in the realm of a discipline. I didn't want to go through it, but uh, I went quite fast. You have AI, you have machine learning, you have deep neural network. Deep neural networks are a subpart of machine learning for which you have a lot of things which are a subpart of AI. So AI per se is not really existing in itself. People are more focused on DNN. But we're still in a subset of algorithms which are called supervised learning. And, and that's exactly what people are using. The caveat of supervised learning means what it means. It, needs, it means that you need to have labeled data, a supervisor, you know, that triggers. For example, let me give you the fingerprinting one, AI-based fingerprinting. I went quite fast. It's fantastic. No, it's not so fantastic because you need a GPS position for each thing measured and for the different signatures. So it takes a lot of time to do all these things. You would love just to have a lot of signatures without basically the labels that you got. Uh, this would go around the realm of unsupervised learning for which it's quite limited today on the kind of tools that we have to do that. So I think also it's all, all about the, the kind of data and cleaning that is the process that you need to do, which makes it also difficult. And then the third one also in telco is that we still didn't figure it out. Telco have been working quite nicely since, since a couple of years, many years, by the way, and we still haven't figured out how to use the legacy models that we had with basically the kind of, of new data approaches that we have today. And that goes, of course, to the problem that you can find is in working and recruiting people. So if you recruit in a telco industry data scientist, in general, it doesn't work that well. I tried it uh, with my former company. For a simple reason is that you need to understand how the network is built. I give you an example. Take a data scientist, tell him, oh, uh, based on the RSSI that you have on your mobile phone, tell me what's the load of a base station. For a typical engineer, it's quite obvious that from the RSSI, you cannot find the load. There's much more parameters that you need. So the other way is to make data scientists and classical telco guys work together. This is not easy, and I've, I've, I've experienced that. It takes time to make communities work together. The third part that you could do is take your telco guys, which are very, I would say, smart engineers people, and train them to become AI people you know, and un understand AI. And this has the, been the thing which has been the most successful that I've been seeing is to train the legacy people that you have in the telco industry and tell them, look, you know mathematics, you know engineering, uh, machine learning is not going to take you that much time. So, you no, know, let's ramp up and give you the courses. And but by the way, how me, my case has been jumping in that industry, but overall, all the industry, there's no AI guy per se, doesn't exist. You would get a guy who's... Uh, background in information theory, another guy whose background is, is, is mathematics, another guy who's computer science. Uh, and, and then they get into the field with this point of view. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, 
Uh, I have been told by the Geneva office uh, that uh, we can take one more question. There are some more, but yeah. unfortunately, uh, I cannot take uh, those. But there is one uh, from my brother. I, I'm surprised that he's here. I mean, pseudo brother, I, since 35 years, University of Cyprus, Andreas Petzilides. Uh, he's asking, hello, yes. Andreas. So he's asking, uh, can you uh, please elaborate on the needs for a standardized AI interface for telecoms? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So let me take typically the case of federated learning. So basically, if you decide, and this is a push that we're seeing, that for latency, latency reasons, the data will not be resent every time to the cloud, which is happening, then you would ask yourself, what do I exchange between the devices? And there, what you will exchange is basically the models. But a model in AI is basically related to the weights. And then you will standardize how, you, how many bits will be exchanged and which time between the different devices to leverage on, a, I would say, some kind of aggregate model. And you will need to say, Every second, we we'll do the exchange with that interface, which is uh, some kind of new signaling format. Then you will have also the kind of quantization that you will be doing on your model and how many bits you'll be pouring in with respect to a certain kind of accuracy that you have. So there's many steps when you start you know, exchanging the compute within a network on interfacing and what kind of things. And also you, when you have a new ID, where you will ping to get access to some information to be running and training your model. So this is the kind of things that I think will be pushed in the next years. It does not require to be 6G, by the way. You could do it also in the advancements of 5G because 5G is evolving, for example, at the moment. So these are the things that people are working on, yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Meruan. Uh, really, I personally enjoy that. I assume that uh, the entire uh, uh, attendees uh, also enjoyed everything, the Q&A and also your presentation. Now we are uh, coming to the highlight of this uh, event. Uh, I give the microphone to Alessia and uh, uh, she will uh, somehow interview you about your life uh, uh, experience. So thank you again, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ian, for moderating the Q&A session. Thank you, Professor Deba for your very comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, so welcome to the Wisdom Corner, Live Life Lessons, which is based upon the idea to give a unique and special angle to this series of webinars, adding a personal touch. So successful researchers like Professor Deba today will guide the students and young researchers in the field of current ICT research. And they will also share, I'm pretty sure, some pills of wisdom and impactful life lessons. So life is always a journey of discovery and learning with moments on mountain tops and moments in deep valleys. And we know that success is because we never give up, not because we never fail. So Professor Deba, which is your hard earned life lessons and or failure that you would like to share with us today that might help somebody attending uh, the webinar today? That, that's a tough question, and, and, uh, and it's never easy to, to, to open your heart, you know, in these kind of things. But let's say that uh, I think one of the things that I learned quite rapidly, and I have a very good example on that, uh, when I was establishing uh, the chair of Alcatel Lucent in, uh, in Central Supelec at the beginning of my career. And uh, for some reason, uh, because... I was looking more or less for funding to be able to satisfy my partner. I was trying to do things which departed from what I was good at. And what I mean by that is that there's a tendency for the academics in order to get more and more funding to work on more and more applied, I would say, kind of research and more or less do at a cost uh, which is less for industry because basically they're cheaper. And I think that was one of the biggest mistake I did during one year. It took me one year to understand that. I think we should separate what industry is good for and what basically uh, academia is good for. Uh, there's a whole process I would think in research, which is very important uh, in general. You have basically a part which is related to knowledge and the other part which is related to money. Because at the end, money still matters, whatever you talk about in, in science, because that's how you get your funding. 
The purpose of academia, which I think should always be there, is to be f- forward-looking. And the main purpose of academia is to be able to transfer money into knowledge. It's not an easy task for somebody to do that. If I give you $1 billion today and tell you, how would you convert $1 billion into knowledge? It's not easy. You would write me a proposal, of course, and saying I would spend it to discover something, but it's not easy. You only have a couple of special minds to do that. And I think university should invest all its time and effort in doing that. And industry should also understand, and this is what I did with my former company, that the money you give should serve that purpose and not work on your problems, but to open doors, gates, on which then you have the resources to go on. The purpose of industry is to convert knowledge into money. And that's also a hard task. I worked on that. It's not easy to convert knowledge into money because you give me knowledge coming from the university, which is very, very high level. And finding the use cases and how to make it happen is also difficult. I think one of the biggest mistakes in my career at the beginning was basically to say to myself, I should do the work that industry is doing. I think you need to separate both. Collaboration has to be very intense. Now, in the cycle that I was mentioning, it becomes successful, of course, when money creates knowledge, knowledge creates money. And then you have a process which leads back again and again. And I think this is the kind of lessons that I learned quite fast and on which basically whenever I went to industry, to academia, was to push and bring that light far away. And whenever I went back to basically to industry, was basically to support uh, academia to convert their knowledge into disruptive technologies. Thank you. Thank you. That's very useful to know. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I would like to ask you also which, in particular, which strengths and capabilities students, young researchers, young scholars should be most focused on developing and how should they plan on accomplishing this? Okay, so that, that's, that's a very easy question. Uh, I, I, I think, and Jan can, can also, I would say, confirm that. I think Uh, all the students which are here should focus on mathematics, physics, and chemistry, which are the fundamentals. All the rest is easy to get. What I mean by that is that once you have the basics which will enable you to learn, you can learn nearly anything, and you can see it everywhere, meaning that you need basically some very important fundamental basics. If you start looking immediately at the applications, then you will get into the process of always having to learn back, back, back again stuff. I think uh, the three fundamentals I talked with, with of course languages, uh, because you need also to have the ability to communicate what you learn, are I think the most important thing the PhD students should focus on. Fundamentals, uh, fundamentals and fundamentals. Excellent, thank you. And uh, the, my third question, it's, uh, it's close to this one. In uh, which fields, uh, specifically technical speaking, uh, in which topics uh, would you recommend students to study basically the current ICT research? Uh, which topics and which field you would recommend? So it's not an easy question. I think here, the same thing. It's all about uh, what you like to do. Uh, of course, today it's AI. Uh, in five years, everybody's going to jump in quantum. And of course, you can see the trend and it's going to go. Cybersecurity is also the big thing today. So if you ask me, you would go to cybersecurity, to, you would go to AI. In a couple of years, it's going to be quantum. And then you'll have also the other fields. But still, I think what matters is that the people who decide to work in a given field just make a difference. And I think all fields today have enough breadth to create, I would say, a lot of opportunities. You know, I read a paper a couple of years ago. uh, It was just after my PhD where physical layer was dead. uh, And it was written by a couple of prominent researchers, which was a bad thing when I started my research. And it turned out that it's still there, 20 years. Every field, you would say it's it's dead, but it turns out that it's just a matter of the right people creating the right momentum and being able to open the gates. 
Great. Uh, and, and tell us one of the most tangible contributions that uh, uh, you think you have made in your career that had a direct or maybe an indirect impact on your professional or even personal life uh, that uh, maybe uh, what, you're, you're most pro proud of? <laughs> so I think this goes in two fronts. I think I've been very proud in establishing a couple of, I would say, key top research centers in the world and forming also a couple of, of key top professors, which are now in, in many places. Uh, the chair I had opened in Central Supélec was, I would say, a key milestone in forming more than 30 PhD students and 15 postdocs, which have been at the heart of all this massive MIMO small cells. Uh, the Huawei Center I established in, in Paris was also, I think, something that I'm very proud of. And, and the people which are there now uh, are at the heart of a lot of innovation, especially with polar codes. Uh, the same thing for Lagrange Center that I built, which was more on fundamentals. And I'm running also the same thing here in Abu Dhabi with TII. So I think if you could characterize my biggest contribution was uh, building the right places for key people to work in. Then on a more personal point of view, of course, I would say that it's more around uh, two aspects. One is more on the technological uh, front with small cells, massive MIMO, and recently large intelligent surfaces. And the other is more on the fundamental aspects related to random matrices. That was a big tool that was at the heart of defining and designing a lot of networks and game theory. Great, thank you. There's a question, and maybe also Ian, feel free to jump in to, uh, to switch on your camera and contribute. There's a question from Ismail I can see in the, um, in the chat here. Which one do you think will be prominent methodology in the upcoming years, federated learning or distributed learning? I, I would put federated learning as a sub part of, 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 of uh, distributed learning or distributed AI. So I think, uh, of course, the big thing is going to be about distributed AI or distributed learning. Federal learning, there are, of course, advantages, but there are a lot of caveats in wireless network. The scaling is one I was talking about. I have many other things I can mention about it. So I think, yeah, distributed learning, yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other questions from the floor, I would like, before closing, to ask you my last one. Um, is there a motto, an aphorism, a book, a movie or a piece of art or music that describes you best or your professional path that you, you would like to share with us before, uh, before we close this webinar? Well, I think uh, uh, to go in the unexplored and believe in your ideas is something I've been, I've been pushing for many years. So, and I think, yeah, go in the unexplored and believe in your ideas on the research front, for, uh, front. And on a teaching and academic front, let's say, because uh, I've always appreciated working with people, uh, is to turn gold into diamond. This is all this thing I've been always saying to my students. My role has been always to turn gold into diamond. And I think that's what people should do, is whenever you have uh, someone coming, your goal is to turn that gold into diamond. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for being part of the Wisdom Corner. And uh, I would like to thank you greatly. Um, before I give the floor maybe to, to Ian for uh, his uh, closing remarks, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, for uh, helping, supporting the organization of these webinars. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all for our third webinar that will be held at the same time on the 20th of April uh, with uh, Professor Massimo Pierobon. Uh, uh, on the uh, information and communication theory with bio uh, biochemical and molecular components for biological sensing and control. So Ian, the floor is yours to close this webinar. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Alessia. And again, uh, uh, let me express my personal sincere appreciation to you, Meruan. That was a good decision that uh, we invited you and you accepted very kindly. Uh, I really enjoyed it as always, you know, I always learn something new from you. And also the wisdom corner was hopefully useful for many young researchers. And I hope to involve you more into ITU journal activities. Uh, and uh, 
So I encourage many of the participants to submit your papers to our journal. We are still trying to get this impact factor. It takes some years, as you know, and, uh, but I went through four of those journals in the past. So at the end, we'll get them, right? To get the impact factor issue. And, and also if you have ideas for uh, uh, special issues, please contact me or, uh, and or uh, Alessia and hopefully we can uh, uh, accommodate you. Also, I have to mention it's totally free, meaning no money, uh, no payments, no fees for the authors, for the uh, readers, everything is free. Where do you find that? I mean, if you wanna publish in another establishment, you pay thousands of dollars, right? And we have also the prestige of IT, you do not forget that. The only thing what's missing is the dot in the I, the I dot, that means uh, the impact factor, but we just started in August 20, right? So hopefully that will be resolved and hopefully this journal will be one of the primary journals for the research community. Again, thank you, Emeron. Really, thank you very much for presenting us. And I hope to see you in uh, Balkan come or whatever, right? Hopefully <laughs> I will come to Abu Dhabi. Thank I you hope again. So. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you so much. Thank you bye. very much again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.